This is a special called Budget and Finance Committee meeting. I'm uh, Vice Chair Jennifer Gamble sitting in for our Chair Kevin Roden, and we will begin uh, our meeting with the brief comments from our Finance Director, Ms. Flannery. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks for filling in. Appreciate it. Thanks for those who came to join us on a Monday afternoon. Uh, this was born out of a conversation we had a couple weeks ago um, that started a year ago, I guess. I, I've been here a year, and spoiler alert, you don't get a a one-year anniversary gift when you work here. Um, but as part of, I think, the inaugural budget cycle that I did, um, I shared in my opening remarks the priority of strengthening Metro's financial condition and what that looked like and, and the key components of that, and that was the audit, the ratings, the economy, fund balance, and maintaining a structurally balanced budget, and how of those five things, we can control not all of them, right? Like, we can't control the economy, but we can control fund balance and structurally balanced budget. And so we should take that opportunity to, to do that homework every year, two years, whatever, and make sure that we have the most sound financial practices. And we're doing that. So we're, we're trying to make uh, proactive decisions so that when we get into unprecedented you know, economic conditions or social economic conditions, whatever they might be, that we don't have to think about the process and the policy because we will already had it. So starting with um, Chairman Allen and the initiatives that she had asked me to look at you know, on my first day and into uh, the new chairmanship as well as this entire committee, uh, we've identified several strategic initiatives to prioritize. Um, in the 2023 budget that you passed in June, you gave Finance Department additional $150,000, I think it was, to engage an external consultant to do uh, the budget planning tool as well as looking at the existing policies, best practices, and modernizing those. And I'm happy to report we found one, and they're here. And so today is the first output of that, and today we're gonna focus on fund balance policy. Just a reminder of our existing policy, and it's more of a, a resolution that was adopted back in 1991. Um, it requires a 5% reserve for the operating funds. It is silent to any sort of debt service policy requirement. It doesn't define what actually constitute an emergency and, and when we're allowed to use it. And it also doesn't talk about if we do use it, how do we replenish it? And so those are the things that we're gonna talk about today and what does that process look like? So the goal, uh, when we were looking back at kind of what process worked best, um, I think many of you and definitely uh, Councilmember Mendez was part of the debt management policy process where you were able to put that in the code, put some requirements around it. I think that's kind of what we're hoping to get to here, something with a little more teeth than just a resolution that can be looked at with more frequency and regularity. And so with that, I'm happy to introduce Davenport, um, the one of the 10 largest municipal advisory firms in the country. Um, they work with a lot of our peer cities, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, they build and maintain their financial models, and they specialize in fiscal policy and drafting um, policy, so we're really happy to have them. So to my left, I have Roland Cooch, and to his left is R.T. Taylor, and they will walk you through a deck of um, kind of best practices and some initial recommendations, and we look forward to your thoughts. Um, I guess, do you have a preference if questions as we go or at the end? Um, how long is your presentation? I'm going to be honest, Roland's a talker, right. so it can I, be long. It could be long. It could be, it could be 30 minutes. Okay. 30 minutes so uh, we'll, we'll ask questions as we go. I think that's, that works fine. Okay, cool. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Kelly, for that that warm introduction. Um, I'd like to say also one of the one of the um, one of the counter uh, well, see, colleague or sister cities that we've we've also worked with, City of Cincinnati. We helped them create a very similar policy to what you're going to see here in terms of discussion points as well. Um, and I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here in front of you all today, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, just one more comment about me before I, I go. It's great to be back in my home state. I did grow up in Kingsport, Tennessee, so uh, go Dobbins Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that said, all, um, all, all levity aside here, let's, uh, let's talk about this, and I'm, I'm encouraging an open discussion and conversation. Um, 
a little bit of background by way of, of how we got here. Uh, Kelly did uh, introduce us. We are working and we were tasked to develop a budget forecasting and policy creation sort of monitoring tool. Uh, we are currently in the process of doing that and that's underway. It's designed to look at all of the funds of the Metro government. The uh, operating funds, as we'll talk about in here, the, uh, the GSD and the USD consolidated into the general fund for reporting purposes. The, uh, the Metro Public Schools uh, operating fund, as well as the three debt service funds. So we're, this policy creation tool will, will encompass all of that. But what we're gonna talk about today is really a fund balance or a reserve policy that's a part of what we see as GFOA and, and best practices with local governments uh, across the United States when we look at, uh, at those things with respect to reserves. So what we've done here is we've looked at the existing um, policies and we've got in here some, some, um, some observations as well as some recommendations for a framework to think about going forward from that perspective. Um, as a part of this process, uh, we did, you know, we, we work with rating agencies uh, day in and day out with our local governments. We're also looking at industry standard best practices. Uh, we have researched and oftentimes researched comparable local government financial policy guidelines. We have a, a enormous library of those guidelines from our clients that we work with, with whom we work with, but we've also researched um, financial policies from across the, the United States with respect to comparable cities that we look at um, and when we view the metro government in that respect. Um, in this you, presentation, you also see some historical fund balance uh, trends and results. And um, there's a period of time where fund balance was can be looked at as low, and we'll see that. But it has very much uh, trended upward into the positive trajectory and into what we'll call the, the standard ranges for which we would see as prudent and best practices from that perspective. Um, as we've said here, uh, we're looking at the policy features that would encompass the financial reserves, and we're, we're going to be talking about it from two different sort of perspectives, two different pots um, uh, in, in terms of governmental funds. The operating funds, that is the, the uh, again, the GSD, the USD, and the, the GSD uh, general purpose school fund, and as well as the debt service funds. Um, all of them collectively are your, the governmental funds from that, that perspective. So I'd like to give a little bit of an overview of radiancy um, and industry standard best practices. Um, taking it from the, uh, the credit rating reports, and these are routinely published on an annual basis as the rating agencies do surveillance, but this is the most, this is the most recent credit report that the Metro government has had um, in 2022 as a result of its debt issuance uh, in that time frame. Um, and the commentary, you know, one of the things that go along with this is the rating agencies look at the, uh, the local governments and the metro government from perspective of four different or four primary categories in arriving at uh, the credit rating. And you can see here the uh, credit rating of the metro government is a AA2. And if you could see the scale here, AA, AA2 is right in the middle of what we call the very strong category. That's a, um, a very good place to be. It's, it's a reflective of the metro government's economy, management practices, finances. When we mean finances, we mean generally structural balance budgets and operating performance, as well as reserve levels. And then also debt and pension um, and other OPEB liabilities and evaluated from a big picture perspective. So those are the prim primary categories that go into an evaluation of the credit rating. And you can see from Moody's perspective, arriving at AA2, taking all those into account, that's a very strong credit rating, very solid credit rating. Um, and the rating agencies generally do point out factors that are either challenges or factors that could lead to an upgrade or factors that also could lead to a downgrade. So, yes. Uh, let's see. I do have... Um, I do have hard copies, so if, I, if you'd like, we can follow with the hard copies as well. I have one up here, too. I have one. <laughs>
So on page page four, this is the Moody's uh, credit rating report, <clears throat> and they've they've cited a couple of things I'd like to like to point out here. You know, factors that lead to an upgrade and factors that could lead to a down. Grade. Those are just the things that are routinely pointed out in any credit rating report. But you can see as, as uh, we look at some of those things, you know, fund balance and increases in cash and reserves that they call in, that they cite as consistent with the rating categories. Those are very important metrics. And uh, fund balance is oftentimes cited as one of the most, one of the most and largest considerations in the financial metric category. Councilmember Mendez. Thanks, um, and I'll try not to do this very often, but um, through the last couple terms, it's not really been the council that's been the offending party on fund balance, it's been the mayor's office and last administration. And, and so people are gonna be watching that in the, in the context of the last seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just make the point that during the Riley administration, when I was complaining about lack of fund balance and diminishing fund balance, the Briley administration said, oh, we've got plenty of revenue, look at our bond rating, it's great. And um, this shows clearly under credit strengths that um, the bond rating agencies are looking at capacity for um, property taxes. Um, and one of the strengths they show uh, was the ability to implement significant property tax increases. And so the argument I made back to the Briley administration, which I think turned out to be right, is that revenue wasn't adequate and the bond rating was being maintained in large part by the capacity to raise property taxes further. Sorry for interjecting. That's a that's a very good point. Very good point. And you know the willingness to and the ability to raise property taxes is a very very important aspect of the credit rating process as well. <clears throat> um, looking at the other. Um, major rating agency that covers metro government and assigns ratings uh, to the metro government. You can see that the rating for Standard & Poor's is a double A. That is the exact equivalent of the Moody's rating of, of double A2. So we're talking about the exact same categories there. And again, looking at uh, one of the key things when we look at the positive outlook and some of the citations they're talking about in, in terms of, of the uh, credit strengths and perhaps potential for up side or maintaining the rating as well is that reserves are cited. Um, you know, looking at a return to a stable scenario, uh, maintaining the increasingly improved reserve funds and reserve positions, that's an important aspect of, of the Metro government's AA rating. So that's, that's again, just reinforcing the, uh, the, the foundation on, upon which credit ratings rely upon fund balance and good, strong metrics there when it, when it comes to the reserves. So, Next steps here, uh, where do we go from here? Just getting into kind of the discussion of financial reserve policies. I'd like to lead into with maybe a couple of slides as to why fund balance and reserves matter. Um, you know, when we look at this, we oftentimes cite um, the ability to operate a government and cash flow a government um, to minimize, if not avoid, tax anticipation notes. We know that's something that the Metro government has relied upon in the past and, and to a certain degree to this day. But when we look at that, a fund balance really is, is designed to be there for a local government to manage the cash outflows along with the the uh, uncertain or sometimes uncertain, but really often um, um, not f not routine inflows of revenues, uh, property tax revenues collected on you know once at once a time, once every year or maybe twice a year at the most. But when we look at the inflows of revenues not really matched with the outflow or routine cycle of of outflows, then we have the issue of of how do we cash flow that? Fund balance plays a very important part in that perspective. 
Um, also now, we didn't have this in the past several years due to very low interest rates, but interest rates are increasing and they also allow the Metro government to earn extra interest income that helps buffer some of the, the budget, you know, from year to year with respect to uh, earnings from that perspective. And the third point, you know, just reiterates what we just discussed in the past section there. From a credit perspective, it's perhaps the single most important financial metric that's under the control of the Metro government. Um, structural balance also goes hand in hand with this. Fund balance really is designed not to provide a, a stopgap on structural balance. It's designed to be there for emergency and cash flow purposes and really function as a true reserve from that perspective. What's the premium? Use your mic. Use your mic. Uh, what, what's the interest rate on a, a tax-anticipated note compared to uh, the bonds that we would normally float out? Okay, so in today's market, this is, um, well, let me start, stop by, before I cite the current sort of upward trends in interest rates that we're seeing in today's market. Over the past, we'll call three to four years or so, we've been really spoiled with both on the short-term rates as well as the long-term rates. Um, short-term inter-year borrowings uh, of probably less than, you know, easily less than 1%, probably in the half to three quarter percent range. Um, that that was the historic range before now we've started to experience uh, a dramatic increase in rates. Um, Long-term rates in that same time frame, we've seen local governments borrow 20-year money uh, in the two, low twos to, to mid two range, um, may, you know, well below 3%. Um, that was that was sort of then. Now, fast forward to today. Over the past six to six to eight months, as you know, the Fed's been raising rates, trying to fight inflation, trying to fight increasing uh, costs and so forth. When you look at the rates today, the short-term rates are well in excess of three three fifty in that range. Uh, when we look at long-term rates, long-term twenty-year bond rates, average cost of funds, we're seeing in the low fours to mid fours, 450 in that range. So we've seen on the short-term rates almost a tripling of what that cost of funds would be. On the long-term rates, easily doubling in this point, going from the 2% the range to the 4% range in this category. Uh, so the premium between the two, though, it sounds like it's about the same, or is the, the gap it's between? It's probably about the same, maybe a little bit. Okay. Maybe it's a little narrowed a little bit. Right now in today's market, we're seeing upward pressure on short-term rates, and the long-term rates are, are not quite going up as fast. You know, they're sort of stabilizing. But uh, then, you know, it, it's still, a big impact relative to what we've seen in the past several years. Councilman Mendez. Just to follow up on that question, um, Councilman uh, and Director Flannery can confirm, but I, I don't think for trying to avoid tax anticipation notes, the relevant comparison isn't to long-term debt. If there's an adequate reserve, the idea would not to be, need tax anticipation notes at all. Um, not that you would replace it with some other sort of borrowing, because um, right now in the first six months of the fiscal year, we'll borrow money from the water department and then pay it back after property tax money is collected later in the year. And if there's adequate cash reserves, fund balance, and you don't have to do that, I think. I think that's the comparison. Yeah, that's correct. We wouldn't need to do a long-term borrowing, but the, the short-term market rate movement is very material because even though we're borrowing from water, we do pay the water department an assumed rate of interest um, that is comparable to whatever we would, are earning on our own holdings. So um, instead of keeping the money for ourselves, we're giving them the interest earnings. And we have, as recently as 2020, one, done external borrowings on short term. So in that case, we gave that interest to an external third party. So, well, you're right, we wouldn't be comparing short and long. It's still interest that is going out the door that we should be keeping internally. That's very good points, uh, Mr. Menzies and uh, Kelly. That, that fund balance really is designed to really alleviate the need or really mitigate that need for that cash flow borrowing, thus allowing the general fund to keep its own money and, and perhaps make more money uh, on its funds from, through investment of funds. 
Um, one of the one of the other things about fund balance is, you know, based on the targets, and we're looking at a framework for targets in this presentation. Uh, based on the, the the targets that we have, and as we measure the the fund balance versus those targets, excess reserves over those over those targets are designed or available to be used for one-time purposes and designed for that flexibility and have that flexibility in hand. So it's not you know it's not just a you know we have to always meet this target, but to the to the extent that we're above the target, then you know part of the process is that these fund balance uh, policies are not just a you know adopt and leave it be for 20 years looking at it it's designed really to be a living breathing document and as we look at it over time as we grow into it as we think about it and as we evolve to the to the extent there's excess fund balance in any given point in time that could be used for any targets over over any one-time purposes over and above that that target just to clarify, when you say over the fund balance, over the 5%, that's the current requirement? Is that what you are referring to? Right. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm referring to is over the target, whatever the target is, as we're going to talk about targets okay. in here, over and above the target that's adopted by, by the government. Okay. Uh, so whether it's the uh, the 5% previously or if it's now a new revised target. But, but to your point, um, Chairman, that there is, I think that's another uh, opportunity for enhancement on the existing policy is there is no conversation if even at the 5% level, it doesn't discuss what does one do when you're above it. It just sits there. And okay. <clears throat> so um, the next slide, uh, just a little bit of commentary from the GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association. Um, recommends um, forming a, a formal, uh, establishing a formal policy that of reserves that are maintained in the general fund and or other funds as appropriate to the local government. Because um, we're talking about here from the metro government's perspective, not, not every government's the same. Metro is really unique in that we've got three operating funds and three debt service funds, but collectively that's the governmental seri series of funds. Um, the adequacy, the importance of this is the adequacy of the reserves in the general fund and and other funds should be assessed based on the government's own circumstances. That has to do with cash flow analysis. You know, what is the right fund balance? Uh, one might not, one ratio might not be the same or adequate for another government in that perspective. Even though we're talking about same orders of magnitude and size of the local governments, the circumstances could be different. Um, GFOA does recommend a benchmark that um, general purpose governments, regardless of size, maintain reserves in their general funds of no less than two months. That's about 16% of the operating budget. When you look at that, uh, of general operating revenues or general op operating fund expenditures. And when we look at that budget planning, we're talking about a balanced budget. So we're talking about expenditures in this document here uh, from that perspective. The, the financial reserve policy should define conditions, and I think Kelly made a great point here. Um, the historic policy that's been in place, there's really not a mechanism for defining the use of fund balance. When is an emergency an emergency? Uh, what happens if the reserves fall below the level? How do we get them back? What Under what time frame? Uh, and or a plan. Um, you know, it doesn't have to spell out the plan, but it has to just potentially address how we're dividing and how are we getting to a plan to replenish that? Um, and lastly, um one point, and I think we've kind of alluded to and said this, but just saying it again, um, you know, a particular situation of a metro of a local government, including the metro government, may require a higher level of reserves than the 16%. So we've got to think about cash flow as well as as what it makes uh, what makes sense from from a particular government's perspective. So that's what you'll see in this this document here in the next several pages. The, um, this slide shows a historic perspective of the Metro government's uh, historic reserves for what we're calling the operating funds. And this on page nine is the operating funds. We're talking about the GSD general fund, the USD general fund, and the GSD general purpose school fund. What we've shown here 
in the table on the left as well as the graphic on the right is that uh, we're showing the, the total dollar amount of the fund balance uh, in relationship to the operating expenditures where we have audited figures. We're showing the audited figures through 2021. For, 20, uh, for 2022 and 23, we're showing the, the estimated fund balances versus the, the budgets in that respective. Um, while we're doing this and what the approach we're talking about here, um, that last bullet point, just to just to really get into the details of, of what we mean by this, is that the 2022 budget, so that, that, that last year, I'm sorry, the 23 budget, we're showing the FY22 estimated fund balance in relationship to the 23 budget. And the reason why we're doing this, we're sort of offsetting the fund balance every year. The reason why we're doing that is as we think about entering the budget cycle for 2024. So we're in the 23 budget now. There was an estimate for the for the 2022 fund balance, and that's what you're showing versus the 23 budget. But when we think about this, is the reason why we're sort of lagging that approach is that as we enter into the 24 budget cycle, we're going to have a 22 final number. We're also going to have an estimate for 23, and that estimate for 23 is really what we're thinking about in relationship to our budget planning. And we're, we're establishing a target because we need to know are we going to be within our target as we enter the budget cycle, or are we going to be below the target or above the target? So that's the rationale that you see here for the offset of the figures in terms of fund balance versus the, versus the operating expenditures or budget. So I just wanted to point that out as we think about these numbers. 16.5%. The 16.5% is in target with your recommendation or the 16% on the prior page. <coughs> As a yes, target. It's, so it's, it, this corresponds exactly to what it's you're suggesting. There. Yes, it's definitely so, getting So we're doing it just right. I'm just you're, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. yep, you're heading, heading the right direction. You're definitely heading in the right direction with 22 and 23. Okay. Um, so that's that's correct. Very good. Just want to make sure they're corresponding. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so just to put a super finer point on it for people that are more familiar with the actual budget ordinance, the, the two point. I can't read the number. 2.551 number is what's in the 2023 budget ordinance that you passed, as well as that five, I can't read it. 516. 516 number is also in the budget ordinance. Remember, we put in a 2022 fund balance number estimate every year. So this would be that, if you went back to those ordinance, you'd reconcile that. So in about another month, when we have the actual financial report, that 516 number mm -hmm. will go Spoiler alert, likely north of that, because we did better than we had estimated. <clears throat> Any questions on that before we? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the next slide is the, um, and I realize we're pushing up on 20 till, so I'll, I'll try to be a little more um, expeditious here. But the next slide is the debt service funds. Um, is same concept in looking at the fund balance in relationship to the debt service expenditures. What we're seeing here is that um, beginning in 2022, 2021, really 2022, that fund balance is starting to go uh, north of, of um, definitely north of 10% and moving up even higher in that range. Now, we're looking at these in two different perspectives because the proposed framework we're going to be talking about is an operating fund balance and a debt service fund balance. So that's why we're showing these two, these two sort of separately from that perspective. Sorry. And just to be clear, I, I don't, I get accused of being pragmatic all the time. I'll do it again right now. Don't get excited about that 24% number because it's north of 16. When we're thinking about debt service funds, our goal isn't two months operating for debt service, right? Because we only pay debt service twice a year. Twice a year interest, principal one time a year. So we need more than 25% in reserves because we only pay it once a year because it's dependent on property tax. So I think that's gonna, this is the piece of the puzzle that doesn't exist in the, in the resolution. We just don't talk about debt service policy at all. And that this is the one we're gonna have to put some thought around is what is the appropriate um, 
benchmark that we're trying to get to. Do we want um, half a year? Do we want to try and solve for not having to do TANs anymore? Do we want a full year? I mean, a full year is 407 million sitting in reserve. I mean, I think that's a little aggressive, but those are the kind of things we have to think about through this process. And that, that's a good point. And to sort of expand upon that point, the um, the element of, of and thinking about debt service funds and reserves for debt service funds is oftentimes quoted as a percentage of, of, of annual debt service. So if we're thinking our maximum annual debt service is 407 million, routinely when we think about reserve funds, we think about, as Kelly said, upwards of 100% is, is a lot, but a percentage of debt service and a range of, as a percentage of debt service is routinely how we look at that from a policy standpoint. And on the next couple of pages, we'll, we'll show you that, that sort of concept and framework for that metric. When we look at, on page 11, just before we get into the fund balance um, characteristics of the framework here, we wanted to show you, based on the most recent 2022 uh, estimates there for the, for the fund balance, is that how does the metro government stack up with respect to peer medians and where uh, peer local governments as well as the median there. Um, if we're to look at 2022, this looks really good in terms of amalgamating all of that fund balance that we see for both the debt service uh, as well as the operating reserves in comparison to the operating expenditures. But um, if we wind, wound the clock back a few years, it wouldn't have looked this good. But what you can see here is that the metro government really compares favorably and looks good with respect to this range and these are highly rated peers we have dealt, we have the Tennessee peers here showing where we stack within the Tennessee major cities but we also see triple-a peer cities double-a1 double-a2 and double-a3 peer cities so this is designed to show you a perspective that we're in the ballpark this 20 22 23 percent range in aggregate is a is a good ballpark, it's a good shooting shooting target when we look at an aggregate, but when we go into the next several pages, and as I'll get into this, is the fund balance policy that we're talking about is gonna be comprised of a couple different components. Would you mind going back to that last slide? Mm -hmm. Uh, again, going back just a couple of years um, to underscore your point about it didn't look like this. Um, there's, a, I've got a blog post that's got a copy of a Moody's slide from um, before, just before COVID and showed that of the 25 biggest cities in America, Nashville came in dead last as far as um, fund balance as a percentage of operating expenditures. And, um, and, and so this can swing quite a bit in just a couple of years. Thank you. Council member Fercher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I saw Moody, so where, where are we at on our rating? Like, I can't recall. We're, so just for the view on the audience, will you put that in perspective from where we were a couple of years ago? Sure, I let me answer my question. So, and, and I pulled together, uh, I think I went back 20 year history. I can't remember the exact year that it, the rating changed, but it actually hasn't materially moved. Um, we've got an outlook change and we went negative, then we went stable, now we've gone positive. Um, but the actual rating hasn't moved in several years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can get you the chart, I have a whole history, but it, it was less meaningful than I thought it would have been as well. I thought we would have seen something. Will you expound upon that just, just for the viewing audience, is, is particularly with um, how the financial recovery um, is touted, was touted um, f uh, for, for the city? I, I think a lot of things happen right before the pandemic that um, absent a pandemic, you probably would have seen a positive rating action, right? When you did the property tax increase, that was really meaningful. And you're seeing the fund balance really meaningfully increase. Unfortunately, while we've done really well and um, our revenues have been really robust and we haven't experienced the same contraction that peer cities have seen, I think you're seeing a little bit of hesitation from rating agencies to make movement because of the unknown. Um, for all the reasons that we're cautious when we budget, they're cautious um, when they do rating changes as well. 
I think the other thing that is real is, is some of those things they have on the, that we had on that first slide um, with the challenges. And um, we did make the change to OPEB that hasn't been reflected in our most recent financials. It will be in the 22 when they come out, but until that's real, I don't, you know, they won't make an action on that. And at the same time, we do have um, a lot of CSP approved projects that we haven't bonded for yet. So um, I think they're hesitant um, to do anything not as a punishment, just, you know, we've got the positive outlook. I think that's probably as far as they're willing to go. This fund balance change and codifying it will be meaningful. The managerial score is a, a component of your rating. This is not just great for us as a, as a government. It's great for us as a rating um, metric as well. Thank you for that. And then my last question will be, um, do we know when we're going to have the website updated for the bars? Like this presentation is great, but it helps, you know, a few of us, he's over there on his phone, um, a, a couple of us that, that looks at this to be able to look at um, where we are as it relates to um, expenditures, uh, bu budget versus actual. I'm sorry. I know it's a little different, but we look at it in, in totality. This on top of that. As compared to peers? Mm -hmm. No, the budget accountability report, that's the report you got. I don't know who puts it out from your area is where we can keep track. You can go ahead and talk. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right one. I think the last one I saw was May. Can you hear me? Okay. As we're working now, we're working through, as June is, we haven't done our final reports yet. I mean, those are coming out. So we'll be catching up that real rapidly as soon as we get the final. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Director. Great, great response. <clears throat> okay. So now getting to um, really where th what this is culminating in is the proposed framework for the financial reserve policies. And we split this up into four parts, uh, primarily the operating reserve policy, again, covering the main operating funds, um, the, the GSD general fund, USD general fund, and, and GSD general purpose school fund, this is page 12. Um, looking at a minimum balance, as we talked about, uh, no less than 16.67%, that's about two months of operating fund expenditures, or or an amount that's greater, if greater, to sufficient to minimize, if not avoid, the annual tax anticipation note. Um, the operating reserve that we're talking about here across those funds includes both the unassigned as well as the committed balances. Um, the the uh, GSD general purpose school fund reports a committed balance, but that functions as effectively your unassigned fund balance or reserves in that fund balance. Um, on the few slides, in the, uh, going back a couple slides, we were above that 16.67% target, but we're talking about this fund balance in aggregate. It's kind of rebalancing the metrics here. So what you'll see is on the next page, uh, before we go to the next page, that 16.7% roughly equates to about 400 25 million, so based on the 23 budget. On the next page, um, part B, this is the debt service funds balance policy. Again, this is talking about the three debt service funds. What we're, what we're thinking about from a framework here, um, not 100% not of the debt service, but we're talking about potentially a 50% of budgeted debt service. Um, if it's not at that point, the goal to meet that within about a five-year time frame, sort of a plan to meet that in a five-year time frame. Um, and again, looking at an amount that's, that's um, if that's not sufficient, but an amount that would be sufficient if greater to avoid the need for a tax anticipation note. So again, that's, that's sort of codified in the policy or in the policy to kind of really pay homage to the fact that we want to get away from that, that practice, not only because it's, it's not a best practice, but it also takes money out of the general fund because you have to repay back through the water and sewer fund or repay back external financing lenders for that. Um, looking at this number, if we were to look at the 23 budget, that would be about $203 million. So we did see uh, on the previous couple of pages, and I'll show you where they stack out and how that recalibration would look going forward. But before we get to that kind of rebalancing of those funds, let's look at part C of this fund balance framework, use, replenishment, and, rev and review of the fund balance. Um, looking at really where's the, the, the benchmarks for 
using the fund balance. That would be for one-time emergency uses. Um, we're thinking uh, perhaps establishing a benchmark of a two-thirds vote of council would be appropriate um, in the event uh, and would only use fund balance you know, below the minimum target in these unusual events, sort of unanticipated, unforeseen circumstances. And we've, we've got a framework for identifying and defining that on the next page uh, to address one-time emergencies, again, sort of defining that in the fund balance policy. Um, a really, you know, occurrence of unanticipated or unexpected revenue declines within a fiscal year, such as the COVID pandemic. You know, something extreme coming out of that unexpected circumstance that nobody foreseen. relate to the excess amount that you had talked earlier about. So the excess would then relate to this one-time use. Is that correct? The, the good question. The, this is really designed to be used towards uh, used on those amounts to be used that are that are take, going to take it below the target. To the to the extent that you have fund balance over and above the target, then it's council's it's mayor okay. council's discretion. There's okay. no there's really not designed to cover that. Okay, thanks. I think what is um, helpful to appreciate is the way that Metro has historically used fund balance has kind of been through the budget process, which is really a departure from what fund balance is for, right? It is truly for one-time emergencies. So when you're contemplating kind of a two-thirds vote, it's, and, and we can land wherever we can land, but it, it's because it's going to be in the middle of a crisis. It's not going to be through the budget cycle. Like we, we've just gotten caught up kind of in our own, um, really, that it's part of budget, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be something we talk about at budget at all, other than do we meet our policy and do we have any money left after that policy that we can then budget, but, but not what of it can we use in the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, the next couple of things, replenishment mechanism, generally a 36 month window, that's three fiscal years to be thinking about any use in any one time emergency use, three years to plan and three year budget cycle to work out of it. Um, Annual review, again, this is during the budget process, no less than, less than annually in looking at that. Moving to- Council Member Mendez has a question. Oh, yes. On that last slide. Um, I just, uh, I, I don't need an answer now, but um, if you guys haven't talked to legal yet about that two thirds requirement, um, I'm under the impression that we couldn't do set a two thirds requirement. Yeah, no, I, I made that up. And it was just to rem kind of remind myself to remind you guys that the way that we've been treating fund balance as a budget exercise is kind of inappropriate. And then it would be a standalone Really, Rome is burning. That's why we're here, and council needs to react to it. So I agree that normal 26 votes. Or I, I agree that the mayor's office over the last several administrations has treated it wrong. Um, but so just, you've you've only been here one year. Yeah. It, like the amount of money that the council has abused the fund balance is 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 itty bitty compared to the amount of money that the mayor's office has over several administrations has abused fund balance. Um, so, um, but but I do, it's been abused um, as you describe. Um, I'm just putting it on your radar that uh, I, I'm just not sure whether we can legally set something other than 21 for a threshold. Whatever the threshold was, yeah. Council member. I hear what you're saying, but I don't know if abuse is the right word. We, we, I have not seen instance where we haven't lived within our policy. So I just, we can, I have no allegiance to any prior mayors. I wouldn't know them if I saw them, but I, I think it, it should be, <laughs> you know, we were living in the policy and it's a policy since 1991. And so it's our job to update that policy and we're doing that. So I'm a little sensitive called abuse. Okay. Um, we passed budgets that had fund balance lower than 5%. That was part of mine, and the other part was the, the replenishment mechanism as well, too. Um, the, the, the part, such reasonable time period as determined by the council should be targeted. Like in practice, what does, what does that look like with a 40-member body? So that's what we were contemplating. So let's say the emergency is, you know, 
full on economic shutdown calamity where we have to go to, to fund balance in a really meaningful way. And I'm saying 50, a hundred million dollars, you know, to keep um, the city running. It's impractical to expect whatever has caused that calamity to be solved, you know, six months later and that we're back in, in motion. So to expect us to find 50 million or 100 million within a budget cycle is unrealistic. So to create a policy that we can never adhere to is to no one's benefit. So we could do something really simple where we say we have three years to kind of build ourselves back or we could make it more complicated where if it is um, a draw on reserves of less than 10%, we only give ourselves, I don't know, 12 months and if it's you know, the more complicated it is the more complicated it is but it's, it's it's something we need to think about as part of this process what do we want to do do yeah just just throwing it out there to just to get the um the, just the, the train of thought i'm thinking about you know if 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 it were to occur on the front end of a term you know you get a different a different dynamic or outcome and if it were to happen on the back end of a, of a term Kind of, kind of same difference. Um, and I'll just say this: this is one of the other challenges of, of of term limits for for the body, because depending on where you are in your term, your your priorities will shift. You may punt it off to the next body because it's no longer your issue. And we've seen that done to what Council Mendez's point was as it related to just the overall um, uh, practice of utilizing fund balance. Um, has you know it changes with the, the priorities of the administration. So I was just asking for just a train of thought on that. I don't have a recommendation as to as to what should be deemed reasonable. So just just asking. Um, moving to, and, and I realize we're going to run out of time here very soon, moving to the uh, Part D of this is one-time use definitions. And again, these are not designed to be the, the exact definitions, but this is a framework where we're really trying to say unusual, these, these circumstances, if they're unanticipated, unforeseen, one-time emergencies, we're talking you know natural disasters, economic shutdowns, things of the like, that either affect revenues or expenditures, when you think about it from that. The, again, thinking about long-term planning and budget cycles and, and sort of potential conservatism, the fund balance is not really designed to do that and not really designed to compensate for that. That should be sort of a long-term budget planning model. The, this is really sort of a one-time event. And then moving to Part E, this is sort of an application of surplus at the end of the year. What does it look like if we have to put um, fund balance into either one of these? We have a range of up to 25 to 50%, but no more than 50% of any surplus would be going to replenish. And that's sort of the concept, giving flexibility to use the other 50% for other one-time needs that are, that are really essential. And then... I want to leave before before we leave this. I know we really want to go, but yep. this last that last point was really important. So we, we don't budget to create fund balance, right? Like we, we try and get the revenues right. We've done really well the last couple of years, but it's accidentally on purpose, maybe a little bit. Um, we ended up with a lot more revenue in fund balance than we expected. But in a normal scenario, you wouldn't have all of that. But if we do have money and there's money left, we've, we've satisfied whatever we decide our revised operating fund should be, and we've satisfied whatever our debt service reserve should be, how do we want to treat um, that, that comes back every year? Do we want council to use it for capital? And I know I'm looking at you, Councilman Johnson, because I know you're very passionate about the 4%. This is the opportunity where I really appreciate your thoughts on this one. Uh, again, as complicated as we make it, it's as complicated as it's going to be, but do we want to create some additional levels of waterfall where a percent goes to 4%, a percent goes to capital, a percent goes to affordable housing? This is where, you know, again, we're not trying to create fund balance, but if it exists, this is the space where this body really can be meaningful and helpful in drafting that policy. I, I, I think it depends on the year a little bit. I mean, it varies. Like we are anticipating higher inflation, um, a lot of potential recession, all the all the negatives that are, are uh, a problem. So I sort of think it's almost a yearly evaluation. I don't know if that can be in, in, in set in policy, but I think like next year you would really want to anticipate more of a defensive posture than anything else. So I, I don't know how you'd establish that in policy, but that's what would be my suggestion. 
It would, it would be my preference to keep it really vanilla and just say at the discretion of council, but not for the reasons you're saying, shockingly, uh, I'm more for the politics of it, and I'm trying to not live in that space at all. Um, but because every administration's and council's priorities are different, I would be a little, I, I would love to give more money to 4%, but that's council member Johnson's priority, and it might not be the next one. So I, I don't wanna codify something that we're gonna have to recreate every time, but I do wanna open it up and get that thought. Okay. Council Member Vercher. I like that idea. Yeah. Nothing against uh, 4%. <laughs> Councilwoman Johnston. But um, uh, I, like, I like that idea. And I'm picking on 4% just because you're sitting in front of me. And then the 4% is in the charter, and that is on the list of things we have identified as strategic initiatives to revisit. And so... I hope to solve that on its own anyways, but. So I, I wanna ask this again, you know, the, I think this is this is great. Um, I wish we would have had it some, some years ago, but nevertheless, we're here. Um, in practice, like how, how will that, that discretion, that discretion work? Will that be legislation that would come forward to the body for the body to vote on, yay or nay? Would it be would it be council driven? Would it be driven by the administration? I'm just just asking in practice. And we've talked a little. And if we don't know now, that's fine too. No, we've talked yeah. about it a little internally. I guess I was envisioning it as part of the budget process when we're putting in the the year's fund balance estimate. We're close enough, and instead of you know. I don't think this is any secret when, when administrations draft budgets, you know, they kind of keep a little soft pot for council to come up with their projects, you know, through a supplemental or substitute. Instead of kind of creating that spot, this is that spot, right? And I think that is truly your council's money to, to, to have. But again, we don't budget to have the pot. And so I'm a little sensitive around are you just creating, you know, is the finance director kind of going to juice revenues a little bit to make the pot appear for you guys? Maybe, I don't know. But I'm, I'm trying to make something that lasts beyond me because I, I know I would do that. But. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Council Member Johnston and then Mendez. Thank you. You're making me sound like a dork that I'm like passionate about the 4% fund. And I'm, I guess I'm passionate about it in that it, I, we have identified that, that it's not enough. It's not anywhere near. And so it's a problem that I would like to fix. I do think that I think a balance of what to do with excess reserves shouldn't just be at the discretion of council, because to your point, it does get political, and that just to me is an open-ended uh, potential nightmare. But it can be to the, at the discretion of council within certain parameters that I think it's reasonable to define what those parameters are and bullet point out certain things that we think are appropriate so that it's not just a free for all because then I'm going to use hunger games <laughs> and which is not what we want um and again we hope we don't have well we hope we have that'd be great to have it versus not but that's that would be my line of thinking is with what to do with that is is have it at our discretion or this body's discretion but within certain parameters if that's reasonable Thanks. Um, so I'm thinking about, uh, well, thanks for all the, the work on the policy. I, I agree. Oh, well, I, we didn't get to the best slide yet. I'm sorry, I interrupted. You got one more. <laughs> the math. Where do, where do we stand today and what is what is the math? Sorry. <laughs> so the the est based on the estimates for 22 and the and the 23 budget and the targeted balances what we're looking at here basically is some is summed up on the uh, the right hand side of the page graphically um, we've shown 2021 in comparison where the actual numbers were but based on the 615 million dollar estimate and the policies we've talked about here we've drawn a red line where that target number is that's at the top there roughly 629 million and if we're looking at 
where these fund balances are. We saw some numbers that we currently have on the unassigned and committed fund balance and the operating funds. It was above the 16.7% that we're talking about for the target. We've had a target there kind of looking at from the debt service reserve funds and, the, and those funds. Recalibrating those that math, we see that uh, from the perspective, if we were to look at this framework for the policy, the unassigned fund balance would be roughly for the operating funds about 425 million. The debt service funds, based on the estimates, would be about 190 million if we're looking at that. Now, the target, 629 million, we're close. We're almost there at that target, but we think that that's a reasonable target to have because we think that ultimately you will be at that target. And then, and then even if you had to get to that target, we're talking about getting there within a five-year time frame. That delta is very small. So when we're thinking about it, this this is our what we would call, if we were going to recommend a policy framework, we think these metrics would very go very long way to solidifying the finances of the metro government and really establishing that AA2, AA solid rating category as well as reinforcing the positive outlooks that, that you've, you've earned as well. What, what percentage would that put the benchmark for debt service and fund balance? So at, at, this, at these levels, the fund balance would be at the, the two months of operating, or 16.7%. That's the green bar. The, the gold bar there would be uh, roughly 50% of debt service. So we're, we're hitting, we'd be right at those levels of the targets. Thank you. Council member. So um, I'm going to skip to the politics um, of it. Uh, so if this set of policies had been in place, there was a period of two or three years where um, not that long ago, uh, 17, 18, 19, where the proposed budget would have deeply, grossly violated the policies. Um, and assuming that we just didn't pass an ordinance to change the policy at the time, um, that would have required um, cutting hundreds of jobs or a tax increase for about three years in a row before we, we actually did it. And um, in that situation, um, and so hit fast forward, um, the swings over the last couple of years are completely unnatural um, because um, the budget was um, conservatively, revenue was predicted conservatively because of the uncertainty of COVID, this massive swing in just a couple of years should never ever happen again probably. Um, so for y'all's next term, um, <laughs> when this it bumps below the amount and the mayor says, well, the council made a policy, so I really have no choice but uh, to cut jobs or raise taxes, um, you know, that makes me wonder whose policy is this? Is, is it a recommendation um, from Mayor Cooper? Is it a recommendation from Director Flannery? Is it the council's policy? And well, I will I, w I will add that there are other um, strategic initiatives that you've asked us to look at and that we are looking at. So a big part of that is the budget planning tool, which Davenport is also helping us with. And the whole goal of that is what. Um, Councilmember Allen has asked me literally every day since the day I got here is she wants the five-year look forward and if once you have that tool and it gets presented to you it's no longer an administration it's all of us we've all seen it we all know what it looks like going forward and so you, you can't hide in, in one policy once we have all the tools out there for people to react to. And I think that's the other piece that's been missing is we've never afforded you the opportunity to see the look forward. And so once we have that, I, I think we all, we all have to own it from there on out. Well, for those of you who are gonna be here next term, I, I recommend you guys figure out whether the, it's the mayor's policy or not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, and in uh, fairness, um, uh, for the four, the 24 months before you started, um, we were asking all the time for, a, it was beginning of this term that we found out that there wasn't a, any look forward and we've been asking for it for um, over three years now, not just the last year. Um, I can see they're wanting to talk, so I wanna um, 
give them an opportunity and then you can come back to me if that's okay. I just, hi, Kristen Wilson from the mayor's office. I just wanted to say that Mayor Cooper's fully briefed on this and is very supportive of this. And if you all wanna call it his policy, you can call it his policy. If you all wanna call it a shared policy, we can all call it a shared policy. These are best practice recommendations. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, we've done a lot of work collectively, collectively between um, the mayor and council to build up our, uh, our fund balances to this place where we can have this kind of a conversation. And I think that's really important for us all to recognize and for us to over the last three years, having been in the budget when we thought we were going to have 12 million of fund balance and that was it for the entire enterprise. Um, I, I think this is some, a moment for us to actually be quite proud of for us to look at the opportunity to have best practice policies right within reach. Um, we have a lot of other tools we do need to build out to go with this as, as, uh, as our director said, but I wanted to be clear that if you need ownership, we're, we're happy to take ownership. Thank you. Thank you. I. Um, I'm really excited about this. I think it's, you know, one of the things that I've learned in my first three years is how scary we've been operating with so so little in savings um, and with, with without really a good policy that is best practices, that is that. And we're a major metropolitan city that a lot of, you know, 750,000 people depend on to operate properly. So um, we are in a unique position right now um, because of a multitude of different things that have happened in the past few years um, where we have the luxury of of a surplus and, and we can make these decisions. And so... Um, while I understand uh, Councilman Mendez's point where it's like, okay, what happens when we're not in the situation to meet this policy, then, then what do we do? Um, great question, um, but I think you have to have a policy to work within regardless of what you know what what's happening in the future and having a large fund balance like this will hopefully, you know, um, lessen the blow of any type of downturn that, that we may have. So I'm excited. My question would be, you know, so what are next steps? Assuming that um, the council as a whole agrees with this, what, I'm sorry, I thought she was talking to me. Um, what, what are next steps? What do we do in order to codify um, a policy like this or this exactly? So, uh, yeah, I guess I could use a little bit of feedback on that. There's only, you know, six or eight of you here, and so I... I We're the only ones that matter. Oh, okay, great. Well, let me, let's be clear. <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> so I, I, I think, I don't want to speak for the entire body, but I think everyone's kind of on board with the GFLA recommendation for 16.6. .6. I think people like the reserve on the debt service of 50% to eliminate TANS. I think where we could use a little help is... What do we do at the end of the waterfall? Do we want, and I like your idea of coming up with kind of priority areas and maybe we just put pencil to paper and put something down for you guys to react to. Um, and just, um, sorry. It's probably easier that way instead of it coming from us to start someplace where you do and then we can sort of amend and hash that out amongst us. But I um, I do think that it's important to have those parameters, at the, like you're saying, at the end of the waterfall, you know, how, how, does, how does that work? Because you don't want to let politics get involved in those types of decisions. Um, that, that's not the place. I don't think politics are, have any place in local government in the first place at all, but certainly not in your budget. Um, so. so I will say, um, again, I'm, I'm the pragmatic one, but, but it, you know, spring, summer, I mean, something's going to happen, right, in the economy. I don't know what it's going to be, um, but I know it's better to repair the roof before it rains, and it's going to rain, and it's going to rain really quickly here, and so I want to get this kind of codified before the rain, um, so before the next, next budget cycle, ideally, like, by year end would be really great. But I will take as much time as you need. So do, do you want another specially called meeting? Do you want us to draft something? And I don't even know if we can, Margaret, are we allowed to like circulate things and email? I, I don't know what the best way to communicate is. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, I was trying to stay out of the way. Um, I was going to uh, recommend, and it's up to the committee, that perhaps um, if you wanted to draft something with, uh, with your ideas and um, kind of uh, look forward to look at the end of that waterfall and kind of um, put something in that's a little more concrete than, than what's there now. And then perhaps we have another meeting like this, kind of a working group meeting to dis have a more, a fuller discussion about it and what the actual policy would look like um, and then bring it to the council for a vote uh, or then file a piece of legislation with the council. I just think it would be nice to have a little bit more time to kind of have a working group meeting about this policy. So when you're proposing a, a code change, I guess this would be an addition, right? So is that too different? I'm sorry, I can probably ask you this offline, never mind. You, you can or I can answer <laughs> now. Go ahead. It's going to be an, a, by ordinance and it'll take three minimum readings. Uh, but, the that, but the actual creation of the code that would include the directive to create a policy, two separate legislative pieces? Yes. Or? Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Hurt. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you all so much for this presentation. A um, couple of questions. Can the fund balance be rolled over? Sure, yeah, it lives forever. Um, this isn't, we don't create 620, I swear where my contacts to, 629? Right. So could it not be used to help stabilize um, um, our budget and debt service and reserves and all of those things. We don't have to spend it all uh, just because we have it. Could we not use it for stabilization purposes? The goal is not to spend any of it. So all of this money is gonna live in reserves, just gain interest and earnings and anything beyond that um, we'll make available for operating. But this is a segregated, it will live in different, and it currently does, right now it's 400. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the thought about the downturn. I mean, I know that that means that we won't be able to um, um, collect as much as we have before, but does it necessarily mean that we're going to be in some negative or in a scary place like we were? This, keeping these reserves at this balance level is for the scary place, right? Mm -hmm. So we never have to get scary. So if the, the, when the downturn comes, we go over to this pot and we say we're gonna spend this pot. Mm -hmm. But we just gotta set some guardrails around how do we spend this money, which we don't currently have. Right. We have the money, we don't have the guardrails. Right, right, right. Okay, great, thank you. Council Member Bircher. Thank you. Um, this has been great, great work on um, the policy as well, too. And I just want to add, just, just for the viewing audience, because I know it's, it's a lot of uh, narrative out there about the, the, the city's finances and, and, and so forth. Um, what, what is the, the largest contributor to this surplus for, for the fund balance? So that has been. Um, I'd like. Is it property taxes? Well, the two. Not, the, not to lead you, but the two largest revenue sources are property taxes. Thank you. And sales tax. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Did the 34 percent property tax increase? Was that a significant part of this as well, too? That was influential as well as the sales tax and people out spending money. Thank you so much. So, um, the viewing audience need to know that. We're, we're in the, the fiscal state that we're in um, because of uh, the 34% property tax, which, which they pay. Yeah, thank you so much, Director. Thank you, Councilman. Well, we pay. Mendez uh, and then Johnston. Well, since we're <laughs> saying stuff for the viewing audience, um, <laughs> the, the fund balance is, um, if we hadn't done the rate increase, which we've still got the lowest overall tax environment for any peer city, um, but that's not really why we've got a big fund balance right now. The fund balance is because during COVID and the deep unpredictability of COVID for two years in a row, the um, budget, the revenue forecast was um, turned out to be a lot lower than what actual collections were. Um, part of that was uh, 
Um, I, I said at the time, we like everybody knew the revenue forecast during COVID was gonna be wrong. And the only question was, because we had no idea what was gonna happen. The only question is whether we were gonna be low, wrong low or wrong high. And the finance department made the decision to be wrong low so we could overperform. That was the right choice. Um, and then we also happen to live in a state where due to various policies, like tourism took the, uh, had the lightest possible speed bump. Um, and so we kept blowing and going on sales tax revenue and visitors and that, um, two years of having what turned out to be um, uh, much lower projections than actual is the single biggest reason why um, there is so much fund balance, which means money we collected over our revenue projections. The property tax um, money um, mattered, but but we expected that, collected that, spent that. It's the it's the extra revenue that wasn't budgeted that largely um, comes from having uh, predicted low during COVID is why we have the fund balance. Thank you. To his point, that he said, he obviously said very eloquently. So it's really important to to project revenue conservatively so that you do mess up on the low side, right? You obviously want more money to come in than you expect. Um, but understanding that the new money that has come in over projections has been based off of our tourism. And so what happens if something happens to tourism? Right? What happens when spending goes low? So it, it it's that's a property tax, we know that you know, within a certain number, we're gonna be collecting property tax. So that's a pretty stable number. That that sales tax can go up or down significantly, obviously. So it's important to have these policies, to have these conservative con projections, but know that that number can change wildly for reasons completely out of our control. Um, so uh, agree, but agree as well. Um, done. Chair, I, I think the point is, and the point for the community to know is that all of it matters. Property tax increases, um, our local option sale taxes, all of that matters as it relates to the, the fiscal um, health of, of, of the city. It's not just one policy that, that, that turned this city around, as some of the narratives have, have been uh, to, to, to the community. It's, it's, been, it's been all of it. And I, that's the point that I was just basically trying to make. Agree, Councilman Mendez. Councilwoman Johnston, but I think it's incumbent upon us that when we're talking about the city finances, is that we talk about um, the um, we talk about the budget comprehensively, and not that um, it, it was just a one-off decision that put us in the place that we are now. Because we know we know it's not. It's, it was, it's all um, it's all of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that point into that. And uh, we will move on to next steps if you all are done with your presentation. I think we've had a suggestion from Director uh, Darby that uh, and as a follow-up to this meeting, you all put together, I guess, some kind of template or outline of, of what you're recommending. And from that, we will schedule a second uh, work session for the Budget and Finance Committee to uh, come up with a final draft for legislation. Did I hear that correctly? Is that... Okay. Yeah, and I would commit that we would get the draft circulated in advance of the next meeting so everyone had a time to yes. mull them over. No, the next special call meeting. Okay. Not sure when that will be. Yeah, we'll, I was going to we'll, I know we got a lot of yes. special meetings coming up. So yes. We'll get we in do. where we fit in, I guess. And, and we'll also consult with our chair, uh, Kevin Roden, upon his return. So, But we will be scheduling a follow-up work session upon receiving information from Director Flannery's, Flannery's office and team. Any other comments, questions before we adjourn? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we you. are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.
has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.